Power Apps just added a new type of container, and at first look, it appears to be something that will make life so much easier for makers. This is a very exciting addition to Power Apps, so let's jump right in and take a look. Channel members have access to download the apps used in the videos, as well as the YAML code used in the components that I showcase. You can click the Join button below the video if you're interested in supporting the channel. To see this container inside of Power Apps, you'll need to be using the authoring version shown on the screen now. Please keep in mind this control is also still in preview. In our control list, we can see a new container called the Grid Container. The purpose of the Grid Container is to help organize your layouts into rows and columns. And this is something that we typically had to do manually with the wrap property on vertical and horizontal containers. The properties in this grid container are pretty simple. We have a gap, which is very similar to the gap property on other container types. And then we have a property for columns as well as a property for rows. The columns and rows directly translate to how the controls will appear in the grid inside the container. As the icon of the grid container suggests, the controls that we place inside the grid will automatically fill the space of each grid square. So let's go ahead and try to insert some items. We'll drag in a button and we can see that fills one quadrant or one square in our grid. Now with our button selected, we can actually see some brand new properties. For controls inside of the grid container, we have four new properties for the grid position. We can set the column start, the column end, the row start, and the row end. I'll just go ahead and insert some other buttons so we can see how these properties work. Since we have four columns currently in our grid container, once I insert another button, we can see it automatically goes to the next row and fills the first section of our second row. I've gone ahead and numbered these just so we can see them a little easier as we move things around. Back to this grid position property, this grid position allows us to manually assign where this control should show up in the grid. So with everything defaulted to zero, it follows the top-down order of the controls from the tree view. If I were to drag the button with the number one as the text all the way to the bottom, we'll see that it appears in the last position on the grid. The grid in this case is read from left to right and then up to down. And this follows a natural progression of the way people read text on a screen. While these grid position numbers are zeroed, again, that follows the order of controls inside the container, but the actual first position is number one for the column and number one for the row. You can see when I enter one and one for this button number one, it stays in the same position. If I were to change this to column start two, we can see it shifts over. Now the order of the control hasn't changed in the tree view, but it did shift over to column number two. The same goes if I set this to row two, now you can see it moves down one row and it's also the second column in. Again, the order of controls here by default when all of these column and row starts are set to zero is left to right and then top to bottom. We'll make these numbers a little larger so we can see them a little easier. Now I've reset everything back to zero. So we're back to one through four on the top row and five through eight on the bottom row. And we'll take a look at the end property now as well. So in the case of column start and column end, this allows us to span a control over multiple columns. So if I set this column start to one and then column end to three, we can see that in the same row, since our row start is zero and our row end is zero, this one button is taking up two columns in our grid container. Likewise, if I switch the end to four, we can see it takes up the first three columns. Again, it's a little bit weird because the default values of this are zero, but the actual column and row numbering starts at one. So for our first button in this case, this is actually column start one and row start one, but it also just happens to be the first control in the container. So it defaults to the first position. If I add one to the start for both row and column, we can see this one button does not move. Now the row start and row end, for this to span across multiple rows, I had to put in row start of one and then row end of three. So the way I think about it is that 
row one is the start, it's ending on row three, but it's not inclusive of row three. And I think you could say the same for columns where it may start at column one and it ends at column four, but it's not inclusive of the ending column. It's not inclusive of that fourth column. Now, what happens to those controls that kind of get pushed out of the container? Well, those seem to just disappear entirely. It kind of looks like they're hidden down here on the bottom right corner of the container, but it looks like their height is actually zero. And we can't really tell because when a control is inserted inside of the grid container, the height and width properties don't exactly show the true story. Now, what happens when we change the size of our grid container while some of these controls are hidden? You can see the grid container expands the contents of the grid to fill the entire space available. So because button number one is set to fill the first three columns and the first two rows, it is doing just that no matter what the size of the grid container is. Now, in this case, if we wanted to bring back those extra rows, we could set our row count to something like four. And now our first button is still taking up three columns and two rows, but we have some extra rows defined in order to see those extra buttons. If we shrink the grid container down, everything sort of stretches along with the container. One question you may have is, can you put grid containers inside of other grid containers? And the answer to that is definitely yes. We can just copy and paste this entire container and put it inside of our original grid container. And you can see all the buttons kind of show up in this sub container. We can apply some grid positioning again to button number one. And you can kind of see some of the different layouts that you can apply. These grid positions really make it versatile to be able to position any of the controls or containers that you put inside of here in the place that you want. For example, if I want button number one to be centered in the middle of this grid, I could set the column start as two and the column end as four. So this means that it would take up columns two and three. If I wanted this to move down to the second row and take up two total rows of space, I would set the row start as number two and then the row end as number four. And that would take up row two and row three. Again, the ending column and the ending row are both not inclusive numbers. So although it ends at row and column four, it's really saying that it ends at row three and column three. One interesting thing I've found in testing is how duplicate positions are handled. So if we select number two and we also set the column start and column end and row start and row end as two and four, we can see this overlays number one. If we make number two invisible, number one is just behind it. So you can actually layer multiple controls within the same grid position. Before we move on to some more examples, I do just wanna call out some final things about this grid position. You can create gaps in the columns and rows by leaving the start positions as zero, but then setting the end positions as the position where you want to start after the gap. So in this case with number two, if I want a gap in column two, row one, I can put the column end as four, and that will make this button with the number two appear on column three with nothing before that creating a gap. Likewise with the rows, if I created a gap here by saying the row end is five, there's nothing in row three, and that creates a gap in that row. One thing I hope to make clear with this is that you're probably not using the grid container for content. It's more so for layout. Even then, there's some considerations that you have to have if you're planning to use this for responsive design. In this case, I have a grid container spanning the entire screen, and I've given 12 columns and 12 rows to the grid. These containers that are inserted into the grid container are just arranged using the grid positions. You can see some of those here. If I play the app and it goes into a mobile view, you can see that because it's expecting 12 columns, it's really just shrinking everything to fit the columns into this mobile device screen. It maybe looks okay on a desktop, but as soon as you switch to a mobile screen, it just squishes everything down. You can solve this with some formulas that I've come up with. So for example, if you have a layout of 12 and you want the container to kind of scale a little bit more appropriately for a mobile device, 
you can subtract from this the result of your number of columns divided by app.activescreen.size. So in this case, while the active screen size is four for a desktop, everything looks normal. If we go into a mobile view, right now it's squished just because we haven't refreshed the screen, but I'll navigate away and navigate back and we can see things are a little bit better sized on the mobile device. Instead of having 12 columns, it's actually shrunk down just a little bit more so that these containers actually fill the screen. Still not great because you're not gonna fit much content into these containers, but it at least isn't showing a whole lot of unused space. We can do the same for the rows. So we'll just copy this same formula into the rows property. And now when we go into the mobile view, navigate away and navigate back, we can see that that extra space at the bottom is taken up by the expanded containers now. So really that formula is just kind of helping to fill the extra space on the screen that would normally be taken up by all those extra rows and columns. 12 is a pretty standard grid layout, and that makes it easily dividable by different values, like in this case, the app.active screen size, but it's commonly used for grids also for the fact that it's easily divisible by two, three, four, or even six. This is of course way more manual than you probably wanna do, but you could also determine the grid position values of the containers inside of your grid container based on the screen size. So for example, with this larger container, if we're on a mobile device, we can set the ending column to eight, or if we're not on a mobile device, it can just be six. For these smaller containers, we can do the same thing, but in reverse. So if we're on a mobile device, we want the starting column position to be one. And if we're on a desktop, we want that starting position to be six. We can play our app and refresh our screen. And what that does is essentially make this larger container span the entire contents of the parent grid container. You can see it does some reorganization, but those smaller containers now take up the width of the phone. If we go into a landscape view and refresh the screen, it comes back to that previous view. Now, of course, I have to mention Fluent2 Design at least once in this video, so that's what we'll look at next. If we look at the Fluent2 Design guidelines on layout, we can see that Microsoft is actually just implementing a new container layout that aligns with their grid layouts from their documentation. So in this case, they have a couple different grid patterns that people can use inside of the Fluent2 documentation and they're basically giving us the building blocks in order to create our own grid anatomies. So we can find the number of columns that we have, the gutters being the gap between each column, the margins would be defined by the parent container of whatever the grid container is sitting in, and then we can also create those regions based on setting the starting and ending values for our columns and rows. And that creates more of this layout that you see over on the right. One thing they do call out in their documentation, which I think is very important with something as flexible as this container, is that consistency is key to building familiar patterns inside of your app. So you can come up with some pretty crazy grid designs, but the question is really should you? Whatever you end up building, you should make sure that it's something that your users will recognize as they navigate through your app. Whether it's something as simple as this baseline grid or a column grid or any of these other grid types. And that's about it. Let me know what ideas you have to use this new container inside of your own apps. And if you think it'll be a useful addition to our coding toolbox. If you liked the video, hit that like button and get subscribed for future videos like this one. That's all I have for now. So I hope you enjoyed and have a great day.